Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 22. Neither eyes to see, nor tongue to speak. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Last time we covered the events in London, which saw Charles I return home from Scotland to cheering crowds, only for those crowds to turn violent as both King and Parliament dug in their heels. We'll pick up immediately from where we left off, after the Houses of Parliament received a petition from the bishops, which declared that because of the mob violence and the intimidation, the previous day's proceedings should be considered null and void. Parliament's response was to arrest a number of those bishops and to confine them to the Tower of London. Now, rumours began to circulate that Parliament's next target for impeachment was none other than Charles's wife, Queen Henrietta Maria. This was beyond the pale for Charles. For all his faults, of which he had plenty, it's hard to say he didn't adore his family. This was a bridge too far, and matters now came to a head. On the 3rd of January 1642, Charles sent a message to the House of Commons, conveying how disappointed he was with their conduct. To the Lords, he sent his Attorney General, Sir Edward Herbert, with more than simply a message of disappointment. Herbert arrived in the House of Lords with letters of impeachment for Edward Montague, the Viscount Mandeville, and five members of the Commons, John Pym, John Hamden, Arthur Hazelrig, Denzel Hollers, and William Strode. The charge was high treason, for subverting the fundamental laws, harming the relationship between the king and his subjects, and consorting with a foreign power. The foreign power in question was, of course, Scotland. The personal rooms of Pym and Hollers were sealed, and their trunks and papers were seized. The lords weren't sure whether this was a legal demand, and they appointed a committee to consider it. But while they were wrangling with silly things like the law and constitutionality, Charles sent the sergeant-at-arms to the House of Commons to demand that these five members hand themselves over. Putting aside any alliances or factions within Parliament that supported these members, the Commons was unwilling to comply with a demand of such dubious legality. So both the Attorney General and the Sergeant-at-Arms returned to the King empty-handed, while the Commons considered their response. Charles was not about to take no for an answer, and he didn't expect a response from Parliament other than handing over the traitors. He hadn't sent the Attorney General and the Sergeant-at-Arms merely to provide a topic for debate. Charles had been in retreat since the Long Parliament had first met, and he'd resolved that now he would stand his ground. The king would make his will known, personally, and he would be seen by all to enforce his authority on a parliament which had grown far too big for its boots. The plan was for Charles himself to lead a force of 400 soldiers to parliament and to personally arrest the five members and Viscount Mandeville. With the support of the queen, who urged her husband to follow through with this plan when he began to waver, Charles marched on Westminster on the 4th of January. And so it was that at 3pm on the 4th of January, for the first time, a King of England entered the House of Commons while it was in session. Charles marched into the House, with Elector Charles Louis by his side and his soldiers waiting in the lobby. Despite this stunning arrival, the MPs accordingly rose from their benches, doffed their hats, and bowed to the Sovereign. As Charles made his way to the Speaker, he exchanged greetings with a few of the MPs, until he arrived at the Speaker's chair. William Lenthal, the current Speaker, was then addressed by the King, who politely asked him to give him his chair, which Lenthal duly did. Then, from the chair, Charles asked for John Pym to come forward. Silence. Then, he asked for Denzel Hollis to present himself 
the House stayed silent. Charles then demanded that Lenthal explain where the troublesome MPs were. Lenthal then made the most celebrated response of his career. May it please your majesty, I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as this house is pleased to direct me, whose servant I am here. And I humbly beg your majesty's pardon that I cannot give any other answer than this to what your majesty is pleased to demand of me. The Speaker of the House of Commons was, by tradition, an agent of the Crown before he was a servant of the House. This hadn't been an absolute rule, and there are prior occasions where the Speaker was clearly more sympathetic to the House than to his Sovereign. But Lenthal had now made it expressly clear that for him, at least, the House came before the Crown, and the House had not directed him to reveal the whereabouts of the five members, and so he would not. Charles might have been surprised by this, but then again, this Parliament had been uniquely disobedient, so perhaps he'd considered this possibility. Either way, he handled it as best he could. "'Tis no matter. I think my eyes are as good as another's," he said, as he considered the assembled MPs. Not finding any of the men he was there to arrest, he declared that "'All the birds have flown!' The king stormed out of the chamber, as the silence was finally broken by the outraged MPs, grumbling and shouting about the violation of privilege which his visit, and his attempted arrest of their colleagues, was. So what went wrong? Well, the answer is, of course, someone talked. Someone always talks. In this case, the five members took their usual places in the house, but were warned about their imminent arrest through several sources. The Earl of Essex, the Countess of Carlisle, and the French ambassador all gave notice to the members to flee the House of Commons and to take refuge in the City of London. I can't imagine that the five members were particularly surprised at this turn of events. After all, the warrant for their arrest had been presented to the Lords the day before, and the Sergeant had attempted to seize them from the Commons itself. They knew that the King wanted them in chains. But what may have surprised them, by its sheer unprecedentedness, was the king's direct involvement. After the king left the chamber, ever so slightly humiliated, the house adjourned until the following afternoon, at which point it voted that Charles had indeed breached parliamentary privilege and voted to adjourn for a week for their own safety. The House of Commons packed up and moved to the much safer quarters of the City of London. Here, they sat up in the Guildhall, with their safety assured by the armed guard provided by the city officials. The sheriff was granted the power to raise a posse comitatus to protect them, while an ally of the junto took command of the city militia. For his part, Charles acted immediately to try and make the most of this debacle. He summoned the assistant clerk of the house, John Rushworth, who had recorded what was said, and together they edited the account to better present the king in a favourable light. It was then sent out to the printers in order for it to appear the next day. On that next day, as the approved version of events was being distributed, Charles appeared at the City of London Guildhall to, again, demand the handover of the five members. But the city was overwhelmingly behind the commons at this point, and Charles's carriage was mobbed by protesters. Charles retreated back to Whitehall, but that didn't stop the rumours on the night of the 6th of January that he was returning at the head of an army to burn the city of London to the ground. Thousands mustered in the streets with whatever weapons they had, the gates were shut, and support for the persecuted MPs flowed in. Notable among these offers of support were the apprentices of London, who had been very active over these few weeks, as well as the Southwark trained bands and the militia of Buckinghamshire, which prepared to march on London to aid their MP, John Hamden. Charles considered his next move over the next few days, but believing that his control over his capital was collapsing and fearing for his family's safety, the Stuarts fled London on the 10th of January 1642. From Whitehall, they went to Hampton Court, and from there to Windsor Castle. 
In contrast to the flight of the king, the five members marched back to Westminster, surrounded by throngs of supporters and fettered as champions of liberty. The Commons had voted a resolution that stated that anyone attempting to arrest or harm a member of Parliament breached Parliament's privileges and was, quote, hereby declared an enemy of the Commonwealth. Things hadn't yet come to civil war. There had been violence, of course, but that was just politics. But the camps were now beginning to form on both sides. The terms cavaliers and roundheads had now been used to describe royalists and parliamentarians, respectively. Charles's failure to arrest the five members, six if you count Mandeville, was perhaps his greatest and most humiliating mistake to date. Tim Harris considers the attempt to arrest the five members to be Charles's most disastrous blunder, while Mark Schlansky is much more sympathetic. It is hard to see what else he could do, he says, and he notes that if the arrest had gone to plan, then the king could have resolved the political crisis and averted the descent into civil war. But the arrest had not gone to plan. Greetings! I am Benjamin Jacobs, host of Wittenberg to Westphalia, The Wars of the Reformation. I am told that I have three minutes to convince you to listen to my show. Alright, that should be easy enough. So, my show aims to use the wars of religion to examine the early modern period of European history. Uh, but uh, most people don't actually know what the early modern period is. Uh, okay, so the early modern period is a weird piece of academic arcanum that is used to describe the years between 1500 and 1798. Except, you know, as usual, the historians don't actually agree on those dates. Some historians put the start of the period as far back as 1300, which sounds insane when you first look at it, but actually, the more I work on this show, the more I agree with those arguments. Because, you see, if the period is supposed to start at the beginning of the modern period, and most observers tag the modern period to the rise of the modern state system, well, a lot of the things that came together to form the modern state system really got going in the 1300s, uh, now that we're doing the research. The, the other dating is, you know, sort of a, a weird byproduct of the Italian Renaissance. Uh, the problem is, though, that if we go with a 1300 date, that leaves like only 100 years or so for the actual Middle Ages as we think of them with knights and stuff. Because before 1200 or so, it was, it was actually just like fallout from the Roman Empire. Uh, this is all very strange. I guess this is why my show has been going for seven years and has 75 episodes, and I still haven't finished the introduction. Now, some people might say that that is a weakness. They might say, Ben, after seven years of your life, you should probably have gotten to the main topic of your show by now. Pa. Pa, I say to that. It's my show, and I'm having fun. I swear to God, I do have a plan, and I'm going to get there eventually. But in the meantime, we can all enjoy the ride, as I engage in the most scattershot ADHD adult history podcast on the market with pretensions of academic rigor. Along the way, we've examined the geology of Europe, the continent that does not exist, the history of a single random family of nobles in the Carolingian Empire, their undeserved pretensions of grandeur, and the chaos they caused in Italy. That was fun. We looked at the class structure of the early medieval society, and along the way looked at how women and religious minorities fared in medieval European society. Uh, it's not great, but it's better than you think. Currently, we're looking at the phenomenon of slavery in the Middle Ages, which is just a laugh a minute, I can assure you. Um, and in a few months, I'm going to be talking to you all about scrofula, which is a skin condition, and you probably shouldn't Google it. So, come join me as I research the early modern period, things that led to the early modern period, and words that might look like the early modern period if I have my glasses off when I'm doing research. Wittenberg to Westphalia. It's a show. Available on all fine podcatchers. And I have a website. I presume someone will put it in the show notes, but it's Wittenberg to Westphalia podcast at Weebly.com. Bonjour. Comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. 
Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. Following Charles's flight from London, the drift to war, as Tim Harris calls it, increasingly sped up. Civil war was, in the words of Richard Cust, not just possible, but now highly probable. Not only had the political conflict led to the use of violence by both the king and his parliamentary opponents, the junto's implicit condoning of mob intimidation and violence, and Charles's attempted coups, but with the king's departure from the capital, now there was a physical separation between them. With his capital lost to him, if Charles believed that a civil war was necessary to restore his position, then, in the words of Conrad Russell, He was only doing the obvious thing for a king in his position to do. Whereas, for his opponents in Parliament, they, or their allies, had just been accused of treason. Added to their very sincere constitutional and political beliefs was now a very personal reason not to back down. If they did so, they could find themselves in the Tower, or worse, briefly on Tower Hill, and then on a spike on London Bridge. Over the next few months, events inched towards a military confrontation between the King and Parliament, though neither side wanted to acknowledge this. What followed were months of manoeuvre and counter-manoeuvre, as the King and his parliamentary enemies worked to secure the superior military position for the war neither side said they wanted. For his part, Charles approached the oncoming war through two strategies, one public and one private. In public, he was the great conciliator, seeking compromise and accommodation and peaceful terms with the radicals in London. He was aided in this strategy by Edward Hyde, formerly found amongst his critics in Parliament, but now firmly on the King's side. His former colleagues had gone too far, they were too radical, bordering on revolutionary. The Grand Remonstrance had been the final straw for Hyde and many others. Now, Hyde joined Charles at Windsor, and his advice was fairly sensible. Charles had acquired a reputation for using force to try and implement his will. Of course, this was a very well-earned reputation. The multiple army plots, the incident, and the attempt to arrest the five members all spoke to that. But at this stage, he must be seen to be seeking a peaceful resolution. Hyde recommended that his king avoid, quote, giving the least hint to your people that you rely upon anything but the strength of your laws and their obedience, end quote. That was in public. In private, Charles was set on war. His plan in early 1642 was to move to York, ensure his control over the nearby garrison city of Hull, purchase supplies and weaponry from the Netherlands, and all the while recruiting an army. Then, With this military might behind him, Parliament would be cowed into submission, and things could finally go back to normal. Henrietta Maria, deeply involved in the planning at this point, would go to the Netherlands herself and pawn the crown jewels to pay for these military supplies. By far the most important resource to the king at this point was time. 
Time was needed to get the Queen out of England. Time was needed to get to York. And time was definitely needed to build up the military force he needed for the plan to work. And so to buy time, he had to play along with Parliament. That was Charles's plan. The Junto had their own ideas. In the wake of the King's departure, Parliament began to assert their own control over military matters. First, they re-secured control over the Tower of London. Then they pushed ahead with their attempts to acquire control over the militias. First, through a petition to the King, requesting that both the Lord's Lieutenant and the leaders of the trained bands be appointed with the consent of Parliament. This petition passed the Lords on the 1st of February, as Charles's slim majority in the Lords dwindled as peers followed their king out of the city. Then, on the 5th, the Lords approved a bill to exclude the bishops from the House of Lords. This would remove a large number of the king's natural allies from government, as well as achieve a long-standing aim of the Puritan leadership. So, with the king desperately needing more time, he needed his enemies to believe that he was still open to negotiation. That meant he had to give Parliament something. Initially, Charles wanted to concede the militia, but Henrietta Maria successfully convinced her husband that if he wanted a war, he probably shouldn't give his armies to his enemies. Sacrificing the bishops, and assenting to their exclusion from Parliament, would mean he effectively sacrificed his influence over Parliament. But the political solution was likely no longer an option, and a few dozen bishops would be less useful in a fight than a few thousand militiamen. Royal assent for the Bishop's Exclusion Bill was granted on the 14th of February, and on the 23rd, Henrietta Maria sailed for the Netherlands. She travelled to The Hague, which was something of a hotspot for Stuarts in exile. Her sister-in-law Elizabeth was still there, and her children, the Elector Palatine Charles Louis and Prince Rupert, had left The Hague for England some years before. Back in England, two days after Charles gave his assent to the Bishop Exclusion Bill, the Lords passed the amended Militia Bill. This bill had been making its way through Parliament for the last month or so, but the King took his time in responding, because again, every day he could delay the final breakdown of the political order was a day he desperately needed. And he was already on his way to York by the time he replied. Unsurprisingly, he was not pleased by the bill. He refused to approve the Militia Bill, and insisted that anyone who attempted to command military forces, be they county militias or the trained bands of the towns, would be acting illegally. As unsurprising as Charles's response was, just as expected was Parliament's reaction. They passed it anyway, but as an ordinance, which didn't require royal assent to come into effect. Because again, a peaceful solution was increasingly unlikely, and the Junto knew it. Throughout all of this, the Junto, and Pym especially, needed to balance a fine line. Charles was acting the negotiator in a desperate bid for time, but Parliament could not afford to be the aggressor in any military conflict. In the words of Harris, quote, Their strategy at this time was basically to prepare for war while giving every appearance of wishing to preserve the peace. End quote. Again, the Junto had been accused of treason, and any settlement with the king which allowed him any capacity to follow through with that charge was intolerable. Clearly, Charles would not give up this capacity willingly, he would have to be made to through force. But it's no easy thing to go to war with your king, and in order to win over the rest of Parliament, as well as enough of the kingdom to make victory possible, they needed to be the victims of the king's tyrannical aggression. They would, as Russell puts it, needle the king into beginning a civil war himself, end quote. When Charles began to head north, everyone knew what that would mean. The Junto passed a Declaration of Fears and Jealousies, which was intended to spread panic. Charles had, quote, great designs for breaking the neck of your parliament. Parliament sent their own governor to Hull, Sir John Hotham, to protect the garrison town and the arsenal it contained. They also sent Colonel Goering to Portsmouth, 
another significant arsenal and garrison town. Both had orders to keep the towns out of Charles's hands. Remember the furore over ship money a few years ago? How could you forget? It was one of the great grievances which had hounded Charles's government ever since. As we talked about at the time, though, this money was largely spent on repairing and upgrading the Royal Navy, and for very sensible reasons. Not only was a strong navy necessary to have any voice in the Thirty Years' War, but it also prevented piracy and slave raiding of English coasts. The fleet had served valiantly in the Battle of the Downs as the world's most expensive spectator stands, as it merely watched the Spanish and the Dutch blast each other to bits. Mostly, this had been to avoid picking a side, as Charles wanted to be allies with both the Dutch and the Spanish. But it meant that his brand new navy, which was so costly in both financial and political terms, had not really been used yet. So imagine Charles's anger when the Royal Navy, which he had invested so much in, and of which he was the patron, aligned itself with Parliament. When Charles arrived at York, he found not a large show of loyalty and force on the part of the northern gentry, but a rather paltry showing consisting of pretty much just the Earls of Richmond and Newcastle and their chums. While Parliament had to resort to an ordinance to acquire an army, the King was able to fall back on the commissions of array. These were traditional commissions, granted to the gentry to recruit their tenants into a military force for the Sovereign's wars. At this point, Charles proposed to travel to Ireland, which would be the first time that he, or any reigning English monarch, had visited the kingdom in centuries. Of course, he wasn't going sightseeing. He intended to take command of the armies fighting the rebels. English troops, under the command of a Colonel George Monk, remember his name, he's going to be important, had arrived in Dublin on the 21st of February, at the head of 2,000 men. Once in Ireland, Charles could come to terms with O'Neill and his allies. From there, he could turn right around and return to England with not just the English army, but the Irish as well, and put an end to this farce in London. This would be the nightmare made real for the Puritan leadership, but of course, it never happened. Charles continued to follow Hyde's advice to appear as the great peacemaker, being unjustly opposed by rebellious subjects. So he marched on Hull, at the head of 300 cavalry, and what came next is debated. Not the facts of what occurred, but what Charles intended. Because by the time that Charles marched on Hull, he knew that it was now governed by the Parliament-appointed Hotham, and that his plan, to simply walk up to the gates and demand entry, would probably not work. But, as Richard Cust highlights, the move on Hull was preceded by a series of pamphlets which lay the foundations of his argument, that Parliament was usurping his rightful authority to select the governor of the town. He had in fact made his own choice of governor, the Earl of Newcastle. So, when Charles walked up to the gates of Hull, he demanded entry, and when that entry was refused, he exchanged harsh words with Hotham. Cust describes this as elaborately theatrical negotiations, which were mostly intended to provoke Parliament into making the first move. Whether the king ever expected to be allowed into Hull will perhaps never be known, but Hotham's refusal to obey his king gave Charles what he needed. Proof that Parliament, through their instructions to Hotham, was in rebellion against him. Down in London, the junta got exactly what they needed too. Proof that the king, in attempting to seize the arsenal in Hull, intended to make war upon his own subjects. But still, no one made the first real move. Sure, both sides made hay out of the whole debacle, and accused the other of wishing for civil war. At this stage, Charles had this slight upper hand in the printing war, though obviously it's impossible to truly measure that. However, he could point to Hull and to the militia ordinance as evidence that Parliament was attempting to overturn the rule of law and the natural order. This was powerful in riling up sentiment in sympathy with the king. He was the king, after all, appointed by God, and obedience to him was required by every subject, 
and yet here a bunch of radical Puritans were trying to tell him what to do. Because that was the other element of this propaganda war. The resentment over religious reforms and the rule of the junto, which had been increasingly obvious over the summer and autumn of 1641, had never really gone away. Other matters had forced this into the background, but it was still there, it was still simmering beneath the surface. And so, for supporters of the status quo, both political and religious, the king was their natural lodestone. Next time, we'll see how the factions which will fight the First English Civil War will coalesce. What made a royalist? What made a parliamentarian? And what exactly were these people planning to fight, kill, and die for? Remember to give Wittenberg to Westphalia by Benjamin Jacobs a listen. You can find that everywhere you find your podcasts, as well as Wittenberg to Westphalia podcast.weebly.com. I'll put a link to the show in the show notes of this episode. Thank you, as always, to my House of Lords, which has gained the new members of Lloyd Collins, the Earl of St. Albans, and Thomas Viscount Howard. If you want to join my ever so loyal House of Lords, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Every patron gets an ad free feed and higher patrons get access to bonus episodes when and where I can make them. Aside from Patreon and PayPal donations, the best way to support the podcast is to tell a friend. All the algorithms in the world can't replace a genuine personal recommendation from someone, so if you know anyone who would be interested in this podcast, please do let them know. It's amazing, and it helps the podcast grow immensely. Finally, thank you to the rest of my House of Lords, to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music used as the interval music in today's episode, and as always to you for listening.